So everybody's going to have to work next to our Deep breaths. Fill your lungs with air. All right. I think we should start to sing one of the most beautiful songs ever written. Jesus loves me, this I know. It's not just a children's song, it's a song we all need to let us sing. And please don't make me sing by myself. Jesus loves me, this I know. Ephesians 4, verse 32. And he had high blood 
time see if we can do it together. I'll help you. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4 verse 32. Alright, who is four years old? Who is five years old? All four and five. Let's see if we say this together. We only have one more. Okay. This is a good verse two. So, one thirty-six verse one. Oh, give <laughs> unto the Lord. He is good. For his mercy and his mercy endureth forever. Very good. Now we're all going to say it together. Who's four or five years old? Raise your hand. All right. We're going to say this together. Okay. Let's not rush ahead. Watch me. We'll say this together. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. All right, you can do much louder. Who else is that verse? I'm going to stand up here and we're going to say it together, okay? All right. I don't want to say it by myself. No, 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 no. I'm not doing this by myself. It's not funny. This is like serious. They want to hear you out back, okay? Okay, who has a verse? Raise your hands. I'm going to pretend I'm 4 or 5. I'm like 45. Oh, plus four. <laughs> 45 plus 4. Okay, we're going to say this together, right? Oh, no, no, you got to look at the front so they can hear you. Don't look at me. I'm just here to help you. <laughs> oh, if I'm just starting the first word. You do the rest. Oh. Time for one more song. We gotta sing a happy song. Yes, right, this better be a happy song. On Sunday, I'm happy. Thank you. Hey, 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 we gotta sing it. We're gonna sing a happy song. Everybody's gonna sing it. On Sunday, I'm happy. On Monday, full of joy. On Tuesday, I am feasting that nothing can destroy. On Wednesday and on Thursday, I'm walking in the light. On Friday, it's a heavenly Lord. On Saturday, it's always. Oh, glory, 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 glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah, I am saved, I am so glad. Glory, 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 glory to the Lamb. Oh, hallelujah, I am saved, I am so glad. All right, now just the boys are going to sing, because they weren't singing before. Now they're going to sing by themselves. All right, boys, sing. On Sunday, I am happy, on Monday, full of joy. On Tuesday I have feasted that nothing can destroy. On Wednesday and on Thursday I'm walking in the light. On Friday is the heavenly All right, now the boys are going to help you.
embarrassing. All right, very good. Very good. Thank you. Let's go back to our seats. Why don't you be gentle? Number 56. Oh. 
Praise the Lord. Good morning. It's good to be here again with the saints of God. I was thinking about a scripture this morning where the children of Israel, where God was going to speak to the children of Israel, and he gathered them. He told Moses, gather them to the mount, and I will come meet you by the mountain. I will speak to the children of Israel. And I was thinking, we have the Old Testament. We know it's uh, shadows and types. It was not the reality. If, if the Old Testament was as, as good as God's word, God, then we would still be living in the Old Testament laws and everything. And I was thinking, it's good to have something to look forward to. It was good for them. They said something is coming one day. One day God will speak to us through men. One day God will, the angels will ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. And we will have God with us. We will have God in the flesh after Jesus ascends. We will have people who God has chosen to work through. And I was thinking how blessed we are, how grateful I am that we are living in the fulfillment of that time, that we are living in a time where we're not just gathering to some mount, that we're not just sacrificing this, that, and the other, but we are living in the fulfillment. We are living in the fulfillment of all the prophecies, really, and I was just so glad that we can come here, we can hear from the Lord. We're not gathering at some other mount out in the wilderness somewhere, but we are gathered in, in Mount Zion, and I am looking forward to hear what the Lord for, has for us this morning. So... Let's take time to pray. Are there any requests you would like to make known before we go to prayer? Yes. Also, I'm safe. Family 
Yes. Yes. yes, let's pray for the afflicted and the unsafe family members. Amen. We say something for Tony Zostra. Very good. Let's pray for Tony Zostra. For the people, for the people in, in, in the Middle East. Yes, for the people in the Middle That's East. Right. Innocent souls. I don't get it how the kings of the earth can play their game and all the innocent people have to live under the oppression. I sometimes think, like, why can't they just go fight it out between themselves? But we know that it's a big... It's a big system, and they want to use and abuse us, and we as God's people, we are that answer for humanity. Let's pray for the, this hour of service. The Lord will have his way, and that we can receive the word. Amen. Amen. <laughs> thankful to be here another morning. I was, I was stirred this morning with the thought of being so thankful that Jesus and God did not leave us, did not leave this world without a plan for redemption. You know, we had messed things up. Humanity had messed things up so bad, but God had a plan. He had a way to get us back to where we needed to be, a way to get us back to the, the place where where it could be well with us. And I'm so glad, you know, when Jesus came to this world, he didn't, he didn't back out when things got hard. I mean, he was, he was all man. And when he got to the, to the garden of Gethsemane, I mean, we can see how it was such a struggle for him and going to the cross and, and doing all that he did. What a great load responsibility and tremendous difficulty that he, that he went through. I'm so glad that he didn't stop then. I'm glad that he pushed through and finished the plan of redemption and, and we can have what we have today because, because he didn't stop. So thankful for that. come down oh no he didn't come down ten thousand angels were camped all around he could have called them to set him free but he stayed on the cross Oh, no, he didn't come down. 
10,000 angels were camped all around. He could have called them to set him free, but he stayed on the cross for you and for me. Often I stop to
life's gone deeper. I cried, I've done too much. He said, my blood's done more. I'm so glad, praise God, for the changing blood. Now I am free, chains of sin forever broken. Now I can say, I am saved by his blood. Satan has lost me as captive forever. I'm so glad Christ changed all that could have been. I cry, I've gone too far. He said, my blood's gone farther. I cried, the stain's too deep. But he said, my blood's gone deeper. I cried, I've done too much. He said, my blood's done more. I'm so glad, praise God, for the changing blood. I'm so glad, praise God. For the changing love. Yes. so good to be here this morning with each one of you. Um, Pastor Hillebrand, Brother Henry's in Ohio this, this morning with, um, with the other pastors, and um, um, I'll do the best I can. I know I'm in the presence of, of mighty ones here, and um, with the Lord's help, will bring what the Lord has for us this morning to you. Um, this will be more of a lesson um, on, on Christianity. And I pray for us this morning get, that the Lord would give us the liberty we need to bring this out. It's such an important, such an important time that we're living in and such an important topic. Just before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our online audience. Thank you for tuning in. Lord bless you this morning. Brethren, the question this morning, the question we need to ask ourselves, the question that the world is looking for answers to is what? What is Christianity? Brethren, if we can answer that question for the world this morning, the world could have hope. There would be something worth living for. There would be something worth dying for. I was recently in a, in a place and we had a reception and the, the, um, the food was excellent. But there was a bowl of, of, um, of fruit there that was red and had green top. And it looked so good. And I took one, and I took a bite of it, and, and I told the brother next to me, I said, this thing identifies as a strawberry. <laughs> but the taste is of soap and chemical. 
And many times today, if we go out of this room and look around us, and if we would visit other places and we see the effects of what so-called Christianity has had on this world, we could say very similarly to that strawberry, this thing identifies as Christianity. But there is no substance there. Now the strawberry we can just set aside and forget about, but Christianity is what's supposed to represent to this world how to live and how to be saved and how to be delivered from sin. And it's supposed to be the salvation of mankind. And when there is a counterfeit, or like Brother Henry often says, a yard sale religion that we can pick up for 25 cents, that does tremendous damage and that puts people at risk of forever being lost. So as we go into this this morning, and I don't think we'll be very long, so you don't have to be discouraged with me. Um, Where does the word Christian come from? Let's look at that a little bit. Please turn with us to Acts chapter 11. If you don't have your Bible, the verse is up on the screen. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. This is shortly, this is not long after Christ was on the earth. He labored, he had, did his ministry on earth. He died for our sins, as the singer so beautifully sang. I was blessed by that song. And there was a city by the name of Antioch. And there was people living in that city, going about their normal, everyday lives. They were shopping, they were living, they were working, they were fellowshipping, they were socializing, they were living life. And as they lived their lives, there was other people that looked on. And they, well, let's read the verse, Acts 11, 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves together with the church And taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians. Christians. I would submit to you this morning that they were called Christian because when people looked on, they remembered someone. Someone whose life and labors they still remembered. And when they looked at these people's lives, it wasn't that they walked into a building that had the word Christian or church written on the building. There probably wasn't even a building like that at that time. It wasn't that they were all just gathered together once a week. The pagans did that. The Jews did that. So what, what made them look at these people and see something that they then connected to Christ, to Jesus? So the first word, the first time it was used, the word Christian was in connection to a person living so close to Christ that an outsider that was not a Christian looked on and said, oh... If you're, if you're living like that, you must be like Christ. Therefore, I'm going to call you Christian. Now, just before we go on, I would like to ask, when you live your life, or when we look around us at what is called Christianity, is there a semblance? Could we go out into town and look at that and say, based on what I read in the Bible, you must be See, this, this, this disconnected Christianity that shows up at service once a week or maybe once or twice a year and then goes and lives their own life disconnected from that is no Christianity. We cannot justifiably put the title of Christian onto that type of an experience. So a Christian is a person that has a crisis experience. Like Brother Henry taught us last week, he preached... A crisis experience that drove a person to dig down, to get honest and serious with themselves. To look at themselves and realize that I don't have what it takes to get to heaven. 
to come and get down low and actually have an experience with God. And if you haven't heard the message from last week, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it because without an individual with that experience, we have no church and we have no Christianity. That's the first step. See, brethren, it doesn't help the world for you to go out and try to get someone else into power that will take care of the problems. Christianity is not a vote, a vote for the better politician. So-called Christianity would like us to go out and vote for Pierre or for Trump or whoever that is, and hopefully they change the world for the better so that I can go back to my life. That is not what a Christian is called to do. We're not called to join the one camp or the other camp. We are called to be like Christ. And for us to be like Christ, we must have an experience that Christ purchased by His death. We have to get that experience into our souls so that we can actually bring Christ to this world and by that, we will be known as Christians. And by that, we can actually make a difference in this world. That is the first step. Step number two is once you have this experience, it's going to drive you to look for other people that have also had that experience. Where can I find other People that have been born again. Think of the, how profound that statement is. And it's so abused in Christianity today. Born again experience. I'm alive to Christ. And now I'm looking, where are other people that are also alive to Christ? And once we find where those other people are, There's a thing called the church. A church is not a loosely associated assembly of people that are more or less like-minded. That's an abuse of the, of the name or the title church. Brethren, if we want to go back to what the Bible talks about when we're talking about a church, it's the Greek word 1577 iglesia. And the meaning of that word is not a building. It's not a place that you come to once in a while to feel better about yourself. The meaning, if we're going to talk about church and Christianity, these are people that are called out. What does that mean, called out? That means you are no longer where you used to be. You're no longer part of the system where you used to partake of. You are now called out. And you're a part of the church. The called out ones. The assembly of those that have also received that crisis experience. Of course, we welcome anyone into these doors. But this building is not the church. That's why when the tickets came that were labeled against the address of, of um, what's the address here, Five, 751 John Street North, the incorporation, that's why Pastor Hilbert could stand out there and say, who are you ticketing? Are you ticketing this building? Now this is common sense for us in here, but this world is very confused about this. Who are you ticketing if you're talking about COVID? Where are you coming to if you say in the morning, Sunday morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to church? What is that? Brethren, on the authority of the word of God, church is a place of the called out. So it doesn't matter if we're sitting in a prison. It doesn't matter if we're meeting on the, in a on a, in a meadow or by a creek or in a building, that does not determine where the church is. The meeting of the called out ones, those that have received this experience, 
That's the church. And then, once we have that experience, I'm sorry, let's just quickly go here to the Bible. But ye are a chosen generation. 2 Peter 2, verse, verse 9. A royal priesthood. Sorry, I think that should be 1 Peter. A royal priesthood. Brethren, this is an, the description of what you are if you claim Christianity to yourself. If you do not live up to these words, if you don't have in your heart what we're talking about here this morning, it's not time to be discouraged. There's still time. You can get it. You can get a hold of this experience for yourself, but don't claim something that you don't have. If you claim to be born again, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. This is what you're a part of. This is what you're claiming. If you claim the word Christian, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And here it is, brethren, which in time past were not a people, scattered in the world without this crisis experience that brought you to God. But now... But now are the people of God. Brother, it might sound so simple, but it's so profound. This becoming a people of God is based on you meeting your Creator in an experience of salvation that we call being born again. But now have obtained mercy. Did we read this one? Yeah. I think this thing stopped working. Can you scroll to the next one, please? Brethren, once we're inside the church, once you've obtained this experience, this crisis experience, when you're met together with people, I'm giving you a little overview of what it means to be a part of the church. You're going to see a watchman. And he's going to be on top of a wall. According to the scripture. Let's read the scripture. Isaiah 62 verse 6. I, God speaking, have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. So, to draw this together. A Christian is a born-again child of God. The church is composed of a group of those people that are born again. And inside of Christianity, there's a wall and there's a watchman. Now, brethren, if we want to claim that we are Christians and that we are inside of Christianity and we are inside of a church, we have to have those three ingredients. Born again, with other members, and there's going to be a wall around us and there's going to be a watchman on the wall. If, you are not, if that is not your current experience, then God has more for you. Yes, sister. Isaiah 26 and 1 says salvation will God appoint yes. the wall. Amen. Yes. So that salvation experience is the wall around us. Thank you very much, sister. That's excellent. There's security inside of Christianity. It's not a wishy-washy experience. There's people that'll tell us, that'll warn us, that'll say, folks, watch out, there's something coming. Beware. Brethren, I'll just jump back quickly to the beginning of COVID. Without that watchman on the walls of salvation, we would not have known after two weeks that there was a scam being played out on us. This is an example of how practical Christianity is there for the salvation of the people in our time. 
There was someone on the walls looking out and saying, people, there's something here. Something's not right. Watch out. There's that connection to a, to a system of God working in our lives and in our experiences that is not disconnected. That is not something that we just show up to once a week and say, oh, I feel better now, now I'm going to go back and live my life. But it's part of everything we do as Christians. Brethren, with that in mind, let's take a look at what has happened in our world. What do we see around us? We have an entire Western world that has taken on themselves the mantle of Christianity. In God we trust on the money. The United States, everywhere it goes in the world, is looked upon as a Christian nation. Canada, Christian nations. Now they're, they're trying now hard to back paddle from that, but when the Muslim world looks at, at, at the Western world, they're saying, Christian? Let me say something here. I don't blame the Muslim people for rejecting Christianity as they see it. The so-called Christianity that we see in this world is no less, hear me, is no less a system of the devil than is paganism, than is the conservative or liberal party than is the Republican or Democrat Party, just like there is systems in the CIA, FBI, all of these systems of man that the devil has pushed forward and created, so-called Christianity in this world is no less a system of the devil than any other one of those entities. It might be worse. Yes, ma'am. It might be worse. And brethren, this is our call in this time, is to open people's eyes to the deception of so-called Christianity because the Christianity that the United States holds, brethren, is going to deceive and damn people to hell worse than any other system of this world. So let's see how this works. The Bible tells us, brethren, the Bible's our map. If we can get a hold of what the Bible has to tell us, the Word of God is simple. It's there for us. It's a map for us. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse We're looking out now into what's happening in the world. What's happening in so-called Christianity. From the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. Here's the deception of false religion. There is some comfort there. There is some truth there. There is some help, some help for the people in those false systems of religion, in false Christianity. And look how the Bible describes that. They have healed the hurt slightly. And brethren, have we not heard this over the last few years? Why are you talking about COVID? We should be preaching Jesus. Why are you dealing with abortion? We should be preaching Jesus. Why are you dealing with politicians? We should be speaking about Jesus. Love, peace. Isn't that the cry out there? Isn't that the cry of so-called religious leaders? What do they say? Peace. Peace. Folks, everything's okay. Just go on. Keep on sleeping. Everything is fine. Don't worry about it. Now, that's okay to say when it's true. 
But brethren, we're living in a world where that is not the case. And in this context, the religious leaders of our time are guilty when they say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. If you're in a place that refuses to stand up against sin, that refuses to cry out against the false narratives and the false teachings and the, and the oppression of this world, if your religious leader refuses to stand up for you against what's wrong and what's hurting you and your family, then he falls into this category. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 10. This is the testimony of so many false religious leaders. Jesus compares them to a shepherd that will not look after his flock when there's a wolf out to, to, to get the sheep. The shepherd's up in the tree. Proverbs 6, verse 10. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. And this can be applied to an individual that refuses to get their help, that refuses to do what they have to do to get right. It's also apply, applicable to leaders. And I would say especially to leaders. They are the ones that are going to be the most guilty on the day of judgment. People that stood before their people and led them down a wrong path or in many cases did not leave them, lead them at all. It just simply helped them to feel better about themselves. Brother, I'm not opposed to getting to, to people feeling good. Christianity makes you feel good. True salvation makes you feel good. It makes you happy. But what we don't want to do is have a person that's dying, spiritually speaking, dying or dead, and just comfort them on and just comfort them on and just lead them on. That is no peace. That is no help. So these religious leaders, what are they doing? They're folding their hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come. It's interesting how he, how he follows this up. He says, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. Giving us the picture of a traveler. Going along, a, a merchant maybe, a, a trader, and he's got his goods and his, his valuables with him, and he's traveling along this road unaware, not vigilant, not watching out, not looking around him for danger. He's just sort of gliding, or what's a better word for that? Just sort of obliviously traveling along. And all of a sudden, danger is there. And these thieves jump out and they take his belongings and they beat him up like we have the parable uh, in, in, um, of, of Christ telling us about this man that was robbed. That's what's happening all around us. People just living their lives, hoping for the best. And these Christian leaders are just there leading them on, allowing, so a definition, I would say, of Christianity, so-called Christianity is asleep, just sleeping, just tuned out, just happy to live their lives, oblivious of what's going on around them. And then one thing after another just takes so-called Christianity by surprise. Let me ask you, how is it that abortion has become a normal, a normalized thing across the so-called Christian country? I, I don't remember the numbers right now, but there is millions of unborn children killed every year in a country that has, in God we trust, on their dollar bill. And we hear nothing from so-called Christianity. It's getting so far, Christianity has been asleep and just oblivious to this for so long that now it's starting to become labeled hate speech to speak up about this type of thing. And the condition of so-called Christianity is just as is described here in Proverbs. 
poverty, want. They've lost their souls. They've sold their souls for what? A claim. They want to be well looked upon. They want to be recognized. They want to have their seat at the, at the councils. But they have nothing for the people. But we could go to scripture after scripture here and just see what the Bible talks about when we're talking about blind leaders and leaders that are leading these people straight to condemnation. Let's just get one more here. What do we have next? Is it Timothy? Second Timothy. Let's just read this. This, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers. Don't we see this? Don't we see this all around us in Christianity? Not only are they not content to just be asleep themselves. But if someone dares to stand up and say something, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And brethren, this is what we see in so-called Christianity all around us. Having a form of godliness... It's like that strawberry I told you about. Having a good form. People looking on. When a person is in serious trouble, on the streets, in drugs, homeless, whatever the case may be, whatever situation a person finds himself in, their hope should be to look towards the church and see where can I get my help. And just like this verse says, they said they have a form. It has the picture. It has the show. It has the, the, the thought. People think of, oh, if I want help, I'll go to Christianity. But there's no power. There's nothing there to actually help the people off of their sins and to get them into a new life, as we talked about and into a community that's there for them, that has walls of salvation to protect them, that has lookouts on the wall to to warn them. When people show up in Christianity, instead of that, they meet this. No power. And what happens is they become bitter and say, if this is Christianity, I want nothing to do with it. (laughs) Brethren, I don't blame them for turning to so-called atheism. Or turning off to something else. Because so-called Christianity, as we see it in the world, has no power to actually deliver them from that life that they're trying to get deliverance from. Isaiah 56. Speaking of false Christian leaders. His watchmen are blind. They are Ignorant. This doesn't necessarily mean that they're not worldly wise, that they can put together a nice sermon, that they can sound intellectual. He says they are ignorant. They cannot truly help the people out of their sins. They are all dumb dogs. What does it mean to have a dumb dog? It means a thief comes onto the property at night, and when the dog should be warning you, he's there sleeping. Dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, laying down, loving to slumber. Church has become therapy sessions where people go to feel better. You know, there's actually a lot of people that enjoy that type of thing. They want someone to pat them on their back and say, you're all right, you're fine. Go on, go live your life. Brethren, if that's what you're interested in, this is not the place for you. God has a message in this time, and he's got people that are willing to take the risk to go out and say it like it is.
Brethren, if we want what God has for us now, it's one thing to look back and say, in the beginning of the gospel day when Jesus was on the earth, oh, I would have been with Jesus. But we're not there today. If you want something today, what do we need to do? We're just about done. Let's turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 48. Brethren, if we want real Christianity today, if you want to be a part of something real, you must do like Jesus said this man did when he wanted to build a house. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep. There is a foundation, but you're going to have to be willing to do what it takes to get yourself onto that foundation. He digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. If we would look into this, he's talking of the rock, Christ Jesus. We've got to get back to what did God actually have for us? All this wishy-washy yard sale religion will not help you in life. And like Brother Henry has often told us, if it's not worth living for, well, he said, if it's not worth dying for, it's not worth living for. So we have to dig down and get onto that rock. And once, brethren, once we're on that rock, then there can be a flood then there can be something that beats violently against it. That's the test of what real Christianity is. If you're part of something that when there's a storm, they bow before it, when there's trouble, they run away, that's not real Christianity. Real Christianity is founded on that rock. And when there's trouble, it stands. When we're on that rock, when we're living for God, and when we have those leaders called of God, not just any leader that stands up and says, I, I have something here for you, I want to lead you, but called of God leaders. Brethren, that's life. That's when you can truly start living. There is happiness in God's people. There is joy there's a burden to help others to come into this. There's pride. I'm part of something that God is doing on this, uh, in this world at this time. Brethren, that's the only thing worth being a part of. If you, if you want Christianity, find the real thing. Get on the real foundation. Be a part of the true people of God. If that's not what you're interested in, then let go of the title of Christian, leave the title of Christianity, and go live your life. But if you want God, if you want Christianity, don't rest until you have that experience in your soul, until you're part of a people that has that experience shared in common. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for your time. Amen. Thank you, Brother Isaac. These truths never get old. And, I've been, uh, and I know we think, well, this is the simple basics. But I've been feeling a lot more in recent months of the need, even for the saints, to elevate their realization. How do I say their realization, their sense of the magnitude of the gospel and what we've had given to us. Be enlivened to the greatness of what has just, what we've experienced. We're dealing with the spirits of dullness working so hard and we need to be enlivened to the, if we can't glory 
in these truths, which are the basis of what we spend our life living for, then how are we, we're not going to appreciate anything, nothing. But I thank God for these solid truths. It's like the brother opened up with. To us, it's, it's simple, it's basic. We, we know this. But to the world, it's revolutionary. <laughs> to the world, if we, had, if we had these benches filled today with an assortment of preachers from different, different uh, sects, we'd have a fight on our hands. <laughs> and hopefully some would be awakened and get their help. But this is no common truth. It is no common truth. And I thank God for this teaching this morning. And may it enlighten people, even to our listeners, more and more. If ever there's been a fog of confusion on this world concerning Christianity, concerning the church, concerning salvation, concerning the doctrines that affect our lives in every way, it's now. And we're the people God wants to use to just do what he did in Antioch. It said, brother, in that scripture, it stuck out today, they're in Antioch for a year watching the lives of these people. They had that opportunity. And that, that was their conclusion. Christians. <laughs> and that's what they need to look on us and be able to, to testify to. Christians. This is the real thing. <laughs> so God bless the truth to our hearts, each and every one. And maybe someone can withstand and someone can dismiss us in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for the everlasting gospel. We thank you, Lord, for its full power and efficacy in this time. We were convinced in our heart it's the answer for the entire world. It's the only answer for the entire world. And we thank you, Lord, that we have access to these truths, the oracles of God. And I pray that you'd bless this truth to go out into the atmosphere, sink it down into the hearts and minds of of every hearer, may the effects of it, oh God, bring about the salvation of souls and, the, and souls coming into the full light of the truth. Do it for your glory and honor, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.